Hello, welcome to another episode of Test, Optimize, and Scale. Excited to have Jeevan Singh with us here today, founder of Pocket MD, serial entrepreneur at that. Going to go into the whole storyline. Jeevan, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me here. Really appreciate it. And hopefully, you know, your viewers can find some of the things I have to say of value. If not, I'm sorry for wasting their time. <laughs> <laughs> Our audience finds something of value every time. At least right. that's what the messages tell us. And, uh, you know, with a platform like Pocket MD, you know, fascinated about where the discussion could go today. But figured we'd start with you. What yeah. uh, What's your story? What was your path before creating Pocket MD? I mean, so like my parents, uh, you know, like, well, not my parents, my mom and me moved to Canada in 99. I was 11. And, uh, you know, as you know, like as, as, a, as new immigrants to a new country, money's always tight, right? So like I always tried to help out. Like, you know, my first business was selling chocolates. We grow that into a major enterprise, right? We were making tens of dollars every day. Um, it was great. <laughs> um, but as an 11 year old, you know, like you, you're trying to, you know, you're trying to find the next, uh, next thing to sell. So like, I mean, you know, I've been selling stuff since I was very young. Um, and, uh, a lot of, you know, at growing up, a lot of the, a lot of the community, you know, the Indian community members in Montreal helped my growth and, you know, you know, really, really helped me out. Right. So, but like, uh, but my first real business was right at the end of my first, my end of my university, uh, you know, for four years university. And that was. It was okay, um, you know. It didn't really go anywhere, but we learned a lot. And since then, we've, we've built, uh, you know, a few businesses. We've had a lot of losses. Um, we've had a lot of successes, um, and it's taught us a lot of things. And uh, it's, it's, and hopefully, we can apply all those and make Pocket MD my magnus opus, if, the, if that's the right word, right? Magnus opus, magnum opus, magnum opus. It sounds about right. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I love hearing about the childhood stories, selling chocolate. I found that as a uh, common theme with founders and, you know, early hustles. Um, great to hear, uh, you know, some of the driving forces about pocket, about your, your, your overall direction. And, and what fueled you to create Pocket MD? Can you tell us more about uh, the platform for any listeners who may not be familiar with it? I mean, so the backstory of Pocket MD is my mom had a heart attack in 2019, right? Um, she went to the same doctor uh over the course of two years she went to him about 20 times complained about arm pain chest pain and history of family heart disease and that should have been an easy angiogram uh and to see if the heart before arteries were clogged but the doctors kept saying go do an ecg ecg is not really a great test half the time it doesn't show anything even if the things are uh problematic um she literally had to like drop drop dead for a couple of seconds and they had to revive her for her to get proper care um, and I've been thinking about that, you know, for the, you know, I have to move back home, uh, to take care of my mother and to, you know, take care of those things. And I've been thinking about how to make uh, healthcare more patient centered right now. If you look at healthcare, it's more doctor centered, right? Like you have to trust the doctor. You don't know, really know what's going on. Um, there's no proactiveness in there. Um, <clears throat> and you know, we wanted to change all that. Um, and make it more patient centered and COVID gave us our opportunity. Um, and, and COVID has been bad for a lot of people and it's been terrible, but as far as health is concerned, it has really, uh, you know, made a rapid shift in terms of how healthcare is going to be delivered for, for the next, you know, century. So a lot of the patients are going online because now public and private insurance companies are paying for telemedicine visits. So now as that, as that market's moving online, the time is right for Pocket MD. Now, what we do is, at the core of it, we're a marketplace that connects doctors and patients, right? So you as a patient sign up, you find a doctor that you want to talk to, and then, you know, you're connected to that doctor right away, either virtually or in person. Because, you know, healthcare needs to be full spectrum, not just virtual visits or in-person visits. So it has to be a combination of both. Now, once that is done, whenever a doctor writes a note or, you know, creates a document for you on your patient portal, you're able to see the notes that's been written by the doctor. So you can be, you know, you can be educated about your healthcare, like what exactly happened. If there's been uh, documents that have been uploaded, you can have access to those documents, you can share them with anybody you want, you can download them, you can view them. So in a sense that your patient profile is being created by every visit that, uh, that you undertake. So, and that is the first MVP level iteration of it. 
So that uh, the interaction between the family physician and the patient is streamlined to, in a, to a way where the patient always knows what's going on. So you, you don't find what the doctor has documented, uh, you know, in line with what the problems you told them, like back to my mother, that we, we would have had that problem. You can find another doctor and ha have a second consultation, right? You can, you know, you can uh, rate doctors, you can, uh, you know, and hopefully further down the road, you can leave comments, uh, you know, so really drive a patient-centered model where the patient's going to be like, this doctor is really good, this doctor not so much, the doctor that forced up their game, but at the same time, patients really have, you know, control over over their health care. Um, and the future for us down the line is we want to be the healthcare with Google is to search. So anytime you want to have, you know, like a massage therapist uh, or talk to a pharmacist, you should always be able to do that through a pocket MD platform. Because, you know, the other problem with healthcare is everybody does stuff, but everybody does stuff in silos, right? The pharmacist is doing one thing. The, you know, the, the, the chiropractor is doing one thing. The doctor is doing one thing. Um, and the patient, despite, you know, he's being his health, he just knows nothing, right? So as we build on top of that, more people can add to that patient profile. Uh, you know, providers in the circle of care of that patient can see what's actually going on and be much more collaborative uh, going forward. Um, and then, you know, as collaboration happens, we can build in proactive modules, right? If you're a diabetic and insulin level spikes up and it's connected to pocket MD, you can have an automatic intervention. So the future for us is proactive patient-centered healthcare. Um, and, you know, we'll see if we get there, but we're going to give it a fair shake. Absolutely. And like you said, everything's compartmentalized at the moment. There are so many aspects of the model that feel dated. You know, you have to get a clipboard every time and fill out at every office to have all of that available in one spot. I imagine that's a very clean user experience from the name itself, PocketMD. You know, I envision, you know, software, something that makes it very, very simple and straightforward, uh, not, not just from, you know, initial booking, but all the way throughout the process and having doctors interface with each other. 100%. So this is a healthcare system, right? This is not a virtual care platform where you just go and get a virtual appointment, right? This is a healthcare system. So you'd be able to book the appointment, you'd be able to see the doctor, you'd be able to see the notes, you'd be able to forward this to your pharmacist, you'd be able, like, you know, long term, you'd be able to book an appointment with your massage therapist, right? Everything happens in one place, and all that gets attached to your patient profile that can now be used to help you get much better care, you know, through the, you know, through the use of AI tools that will develop further down the road. And... Uh... As you're putting this all together, have you received warm feedback uh, from, you know, the doctors, the pharmacists, all the different groups involved? Are there potentials for strategic partnerships there? I mean, so on the doctor side, funny enough, you mentioned that the doctor softwares are terrible, right? <laughs> uh, they're so bad. I mean, you know, doctors spend six hours a day documenting appointments. Uh, half the time in family settings, it's 50% of the information is duplicate. Um, in you know, in emergency settings, over 70% of that information is duplicate. Um, and, you know, because there's a lot of entry points for duplicate information, there's a lot of entry points for errors. Uh, a quarter million people in the, U in the U.S. die every year of errors in the doctor side software. So that's a huge problem in and of itself. So in, we were thinking about initially integrating with the current software, but then we're like, no, we're not going to do this. We'll just build our own. We'll just start. We'll just start the slate clean. So, uh, from that perspective, you know, the doctors have been very warm towards what we're building. First of all, it just looks nice, right? The fact that it looks nice is a big one in our favor. So they love that, right? So that's something nice to see every day. Um, and then, in terms of the patient standpoint, we've been talking to a lot of patient advocacy groups uh, that have been looking for something like this to give pe you know patients control of their healthcare. And these advocacy groups are really, you know, you know, trying supporting us and helping us, you know, find the right avenues for, for distribution on the patient side, right? Because nobody's ever done this before, right? This is brand new and if nobody in the healthcare space never, never really thinks about the patients. We're the only ones. 
Very interesting. And how, how, meaning, I had not realized this had not been done before. You're the first of its kind. D does this remove the insurance company by any chance? Does it go, you know, direct from patient uh, to healthcare provider? If not, how does the insurance company respond to this? How do they play a role in the whole discussion? Insurance companies love this. Right. So if you look at, you know, the role of insurance companies, either in Canada, we have public insurance companies that cover health care uh, in the U.S. There's a lot of private ones and some public ones. Um, you know, they have, you know, they're still going to be paying for the service. Right. So this the model of who pays for the service doesn't change. It's how that service is delivered. Now, from an insurance standpoint, there's a lot of health care fraud that happens. Right. Like people are just making up stuff. Um, I have invested in a few pain management clinics where, and, you know, we get calls from insurance companies all the time. Hey, did you write this prescription? And, you know, and my doctors and my podiatrists would be like, no, we have no idea who wrote this, right? So once you have a patient, patient portal and every document that's uploaded from the doctor goes directly into that patient portal, now you can start sharing that document directly to the insurance company, mm. right? So there's like, you can't, there's no scope for, yeah, I mean, there's no scope for making it up in the middle. Insurance companies love this, right? Um, and there are a few uh, companies that are trying to do this, where patients have access to all their documents, um, and they, they can, from there, share it with the insurance company, right? And the insurance companies are really driving this adoption for those products. But those products are just a feature in what we do as part of a larger healthcare system. Okay. And uh, that centralized location, I imagine, does so much. I mean, I've heard so many different aspects of the, the pain points of the business model. It's definitely an area that is uh, set for disruption, set for growth. Has there been resistance to implementing uh, these different types of foundations for any reason? Or is it warmly welcomed? I mean, so like right now, we're still in build mode, right? That said, I'm still going out there, like, you know, trying to get people on the wait list. Uh, you know, trying to get partnerships in place. And everybody loves what we're doing. There hasn't, I mean, the only feed, the poor feedback we got was, hey, what if the patient sees the notes that I've written? What if he nitpicks on those notes? Sure. And the answer to that is write better notes. <laughs> you know, like this is a patient centered, <laughs> this is patient centered healthcare, write better notes. <laughs> yeah. And, and you'll always find some people that will nitpick, but you can't avoid those, right? Like in Canada, Patients have a right to access the information, and those people will just ask you to print those notes, right? Now it's just easier for them to nitpick, right? But, but that's, the only, that's the only bad feedback we've gotten, but, but primarily it has been really good. Um, the, the stuff that doctors really like about this is the ability to have multiple, you know, you know allied health professionals add to that profile. Like, you know, like that's never been done before. And like, imagine the collaboration that could happen. Yes, absolutely. Doctor's notes. I picture, you know, a bunch of scribble uh, talking <laughs> yeah. about the patient directly. And I joke around about that, uh, you know, referencing some of my friends who are doctors and different medical professionals. But I yeah. imagine this definitely streamlines it, makes it easier to connect to each different segment. How long did it take you to come up with this? How long have you been working on Pocket MD? Uh, have there been different obstacles along the road here? What does the timeline look like? Um, like, so we're launching, like we did like a beta launch um, that we tested out with some professionals and some patients. We're looking at the alpha in the next like, you know, three to four months, um, you know, as, as a full launch. Uh, but because this is tech, this could go a little bit earlier. It could go a little bit later. Like you can't, you know, th things happen in development that we can't, you know, that we can't plan for. Um, so, you know, so that, so I mean, so like the time, the timeline is three to four months. Um, and I forgot what the other part of the question was. <laughs> the overall timeline for how long you've been working on it and if there's been any obstacles, even any pivots that have had to occur uh, throughout that duration. Right. So, you know, you know, Pocket MD has been a business for me, but I haven't really had much obstacles, right? Like, I mean, I've, I've built products and businesses before where, like, either lining up the funding was a problem, finding the right talent was a problem, finding product market fit was a problem. People didn't want to partner with you, uh, right? Like, a lot, I've gone through so many problems that with Pocket MD was like, okay, we have a, you know, we had a pain management clinic. 
And, you know, uh, and we saw that, you know, the OHIP, OHIP is the public insurance company for Ontario, the province of Ontario. They started covering telemedicine visits and the light bulb went up. It was like, okay, why don't we just build an online platform to connect people? While we started doing that, we started finding a lot of these different problems with current EMRs. So we just kept building on top of it. Right. The money was never an issue because, you know, I'm an entrepreneur. I have my own now. I don't have to go ask anybody. I just do it. Um, and then, you know, as the more that we talk to people, the more we realize how how big, uh, you know, an opportunity this is to really make healthcare patient centered because nobody really has done it. And I was really surprised that nobody's done it, but count myself lucky, I guess. Have there been any reasons why other groups haven't done it? When you were researching the industry, have any other groups attempted it over time? I mean, so Apple Health is trying to integrate with, um, you know, with different uh, EMR providers like Cerner, Epic, um, and so they can patient can pull their data uh, and view that data in an Apple Health app, right? But the problem that I find with healthcare is, healthcare is very big. It's huge. It's probably the biggest industry in the world, right? So everybody picks a niche. Okay, I'll solve this problem. And it's been, and those are big problems to solve, right? I mean, just scheduling in healthcare, you know, you're a billion dollar company, right? Or just document sharing in healthcare, you're a multi-billion dollar company. So those are large enough. So people are like, okay, well, I'll just do this and I'll do this. Nobody has like a really bold vision to change the entire thing, right? Um, and, and, and I feel like for me, the way I look at these things is, I don't want anybody else's mother to go through what my mother went through. And for me, to be able to do that, I have to have a bold vision for the future of healthcare. If that makes any sense. Absolutely. The bold vision, uh, it, it, you know, I'm picturing other groups who, you know, maybe whiteboarded something uh, like this out in the past and then had their own reasons specific to their business model. Uh, but you, you were very... Uh, committed to making this happen and had that personal story in the background to uh, motivate you all the way through. Right. And uh, you know, the thing is like, you know, some of the people that understand timing has to be right as well. Right. Like this wasn't possible pre COVID. Uh, you know, like we know that firsthand from our you know experience in our pain management clinic, where we would send patients to doctors, the doctors would be like, we can't see a patient. We have enough on our own. Right now, all of a sudden, the patient's moving online and they have to follow suit. Right. So the timing is absolutely right. Um, and some other people may have had a bold vision, but like pre-COVID, this really wasn't possible. You know, it's really uh, remarkable how much things have changed and how uh, adoption rates have changed among these target audiences over the past year. Oh, yeah. Like, I'm, you know, and the thing is, it's I mean, COVID has been, again, bad for a lot of people, but for healthcare it's going to push us to be better, right? Uh, but, you know, if you look at prior academic, epidemics that have happened, like the MERS uh, crisis, um, that was primarily, like, you know, Middle Eastern and, you know, in the Korean Peninsula, like, we, we never really, you know, Europe and North America never really had a real epidemic, right? Now that we've had one, we know we need to change and make our healthcare system more resilient and better, Right? Just from a, like, I mean, you know, just from a health tracking standpoint, like, you know, because all these, you know, patient entry systems are siloed out, like this hospital will have this, uh, you know, app will, will have their own database. This hospital will have their own database. Just connecting patient data and finding out where pockets of disease are, are not really possible, right? <laughs> so you need that centralized location and like, and now the people who've gone through that epidemic, they know that they need to get better and, you know, evolve and, you know, do things differently. And as a, as a data guy who, you know, spends a good portion of the day digging through analytics, what does that mean for medical records? Are you able to get certain permissions so you can look at the statistics on a larger geographical scale? Are you able to get uh, deeper insights to what's occurring with any one of these conditions that are becoming prevalent? So like, you know, being a spreadsheet geek, this is very exciting for me, right? Uh, like as long as you de-identify the data, where is it instead of saying, Jeevan Singh 32 has this problem, as long as I take the Jeevan Singh out and say male 32 has this problem, now you can start playing around with that data, right? And 
right? Instead of saying like he lives at XYZ address, he can say he lives in this postal code, which is enough of a stratification to really identify disease pockets, right? A lot yeah. of cool things you can do. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I can think of all the statistics you would build from there as well too. Uh, is there any type of closed feedback loop? Are you then providing that info to medical professionals uh, to, to any degree? So our hope is to be able to like, you know, and this is like a long-term play, right? Unless we have a real amount of data, we won't be able to do this. And for us to have a real amount of data, we got to be successful. And if we are, we hope to be able to like work with local government agencies and local governments to really help them say, these are the diseases that we're seeing. This is where we need to invest money. These are the, you know, area codes where this is the disease pocket. So why don't you go there and like focus your efforts on there? Like, I mean, like, you know, for us, that would be more of a social enterprise kind of undertaking um, where we would work with local governments and really help them identify what's going on. Sure. So are those some of the primary long-term goals are, you know, being able to build those type of reports with governments? Uh, you know, I imagine you can't share all of your plans, but at the same time, what is long-term Pocket MD look like? Long-term Pocket MD looks like a proactive system, you know, in the sense that, like, you know, you know, again, I used this example before. You have an insulin spike, right? And that is connected to Pocket MD. Right away, you get a call from a doctor, be like, or maybe not right away, maybe not instantaneously, but you get an appointment notification with your doctor that says, hey, buddy, what happened? Let's get back on track. Right. Um, in long term, you know, that's what it looks like. Proactive health care. Right. I mean, if we know that you're, you know, you fit a certain mold. Right. Like, for example, I'm Indian. Um, you know, I've gained a lot of weight over the past few years, you know, but like, you know, I'm trying to lose it. But I, but I have but you know, I'm like, you know, I'm the fatter category, uh, um, you know, and, you know, I have a family history of heart disease. If we fit that mold, like we want to be able to give people recommendations on, you know, how to how to address that and how to be better. Right. Mm -hmm. um, like, I mean, you know, when you go to Google, they'll give you notification on, on stupid items that you don't need. Right. We want to take that same idea and really help you live longer with that. Mm -hmm. Love it. And this is, uh, you know, such area of interest for me. Uh, DNA testing, some of the statistics that it's been able to provide. Mm -hmm. uh, I've gone through various uh, different studies myself, too. Uh, I I'm uh, uh, very interested in neuroscience. I've been able to get a better sense for uh, individual aspects of me. Uh, but even just the the 23andMe ancestries and some of the health statistics it provides and how you can live a better life, I imagine yeah. being able to have that and then integrate it in, uh, in that central location for all of these uh, medical groups that you're using uh, over the course of years, decades at that, uh, it's just going to be a whole new evolution uh, of what the medical industry looks like in years to come. 100%. Like, the, you know, imagine this, right? Like, you know, we not we have data on person X does Y, he goes to Z, right? Mm -hmm. Once we start aggregating that, we can start, like, you know, identifying what may happen earlier. And then, you know, we can, you know, instead of, like, you know, you having to go through that, you know, that ebb and flow of your lifespan, we could build your healthy lifespan. So instead of, like, you know, like, think about it this way. The goal is to shift you know, us thinking about our lives in terms of lifespans and start thinking of our lives in terms of health spans. How healthy are we as we live, right? Because that ultimately, if you're not healthy, you ain't living. Health is at the top. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, there's been a lot of <sighs> lacks of clarity around health in the past. You know, you go to your doctor once a year, whatever it yeah. is, and uh, that's the extent of it unless you have a problem. Uh, you know, everyone's <laughs> focused on their, their diet and how many steps that they're taking and, and all these other areas that technology provides for. So, uh, again, I could see this being a big part of the next stages of that growth. You know, you know funny thing, I'll, I'll share a story with you. Like, I have, I have a condition called chronic hives uh, where, like, I have to take, like, you know, antihistamines. Like, I got, like, my 200 pack right here. I take a pill every day. I'm okay. Otherwise, I break out in hives. Um, and it took me a year and a half to go see a doctor just because the, the experience wasn't pleasant and I knew what was I, guess I was going to get. Nobody's going to really tell me anything, 
right? They're going to hey, do this test, do this test. And I was really wasn't going to be educated. Um, I really got lucky where, but, you know, uh, you know, I was working with, a, you know, with somebody at the time and he was like, hey, well, this could just be a simple allergy where you don't, where you don't need to take a medication. We went through different types and like we landed on antihistamines and I was looking it up more and more. I, I realized that this is actually a condition called chronic hives, right? Um, and it helped me with it. But like first I found the solution, then I found out why it helped me, right? <laughs> Like, I mean, but once we start having all this data in place, then you can be like, okay, this is what's happening. And you can have other people share their stories too, right? Like, this is what happened. This is what solved it, right? Like, all that data in one place can do wonders for diseases that are not, that, that are not identified or are misdiagnosed. Funny how that works. Getting the solution, then realizing what the issue is. I've had uh, similar types of uh, situations for health. Uh, yeah. and other conditions that I'm always trying to learn what I can be doing to treat. Uh, but uh, very fascinating. So how have you gone about building this from a marketing perspective? How have you looked at, uh, you know, marketplace, uh, healthcare professionals and patients? What have you been doing in terms of tactics uh, to build up those user bases and overall awareness? So, like, I mean, you know, the first hundred customer, the first hundred doctors in our case, you want to do it very inefficiently, right? In a sense, they want to be able to talk to them, get their feedback, iterate. So when you are doing things efficiently, it's an efficient product that you pitch into the market, right? Um, so we have two doctors on staff um, that are helping us. Um, one of them gave me money. I didn't need the money, but he's like, you got to have it. Take it. I literally like this. Take the money. I was like, okay, cool. We'll take it. Uh, they didn't have to, like, you know, sell me on it too hard, but, you know. But so, you know, and so they've been helping us, introducing us to different, um, different doctors. Um, and then we also, you know, have a list of, you know, doctor clinics, uh, fax numbers, emails that we're reaching out to, um, to build partnerships. And then there's a lot of uh, groups uh, that doctors are affiliated with, right? Uh, there's a women in medicine group, specifically in Canada, that has about 7,000 members, which is about 7, 7% of all doctors in Canada. Right. So, I mean, we haven't reached out to them yet, but like we'll start reaching out to people like that um, in the near future to build those partnerships from a, and, you know, and, you know, and because this is a marketplace, we're effectively building two businesses. Right. We're building the supply side and then we're also building the demand side um, on the pay, on the demand side of the patient side. We are hoping that our doctor platform is so good that the doctors will add their own patients. And, you know, and that's and if so far everybody's agreed to like all the 50 to 60 doctors that have fully committed to this have all agreed to do it right um and that's over 100,000 patients and that's we, we can't be thankful more thankful for you know thankful for that but uh, we, we can't be thankful enough rather yeah that's the word <laughs> <laughs> thankful. Uh, I but, completely get it and so being able to yeah. use those doctors as strategic partners because you're able to tap in to their current patient lists. Exactly. So, yeah, it's growing exponentially. Yeah, so I mean, so they're like, so we, I mean, so like, because we're not in the market, it's not growing exponentially yet, but the partnerships are there to make it grow, right? Like the doctor, instead of the pay, him seeing his patient on his current EMR, he will see it on the Pocket MD EMR, right? And that patient would be added to the Pocket MD, you know, platform. Um, and then there's other partnerships. Uh, with uh, you know, with, with with businesses that are prescription driven, uh, that you know that we're looking at, um, and because you know because of my experience in the healthcare space and my pain management clinic experience, um, and uh, and I have another business that imports and exports orthopedic products. Uh, we have a lot of connections to these pain management clinics that need referrals and they need doctor they they need doctor prescriptions. Right. Otherwise, these the patients don't get reimbursement from insurance companies. So they're coming on board as well. We have a whole bunch of them. So we just got to like get in the market and just connect everybody. There you go. And then the, the peer to peer marketing among the doctors, among the health groups, uh, even around the patients and getting, uh, you know, requests into those doctors and larger health groups. I imagine it comes systematically. Uh, yeah. Very, very interesting. Have you been focusing on specific types of doctors, found them to be a stronger fit for your model, or really just across the board? So we want to streamline the interaction between the family clinic and the patient first, um, because the last the lowest bill. I mean, still the bill is still quite large. <laughs> that said, it's the lowest uh, bill barrier. 
Um, and then as we grow, I mean, we're not saying cardiologists can't join our platform. You can, but from an EMR perspective, we may not be robust enough. That said, all your virtual consultations can be done on our platform. So it's robust enough for that. But if you do a surgery, then billing for that pocket MD may not be a great fit. But for 90% of the items, it'll be a great fit. Interesting. Now, have you tried any marketing direct to consumer uh, or really just focused larger uh, at the doctors and getting them to integrate it into their processes? So right now, I mean, so my, so this is not my first marketplace, right? We've built sure. a marketplace before this. And what we've realized is, is supply gets demand. So we have to have a good enough roster of doctors. The patients will come, right, um, after that. But if you have the patients, the doctors may not necessarily join your platform. Sure. So not so much of a chicken before the egg dilemma, more of get the supply, the demand follows. Exactly. Love it. Love it. And, you know, very impressed by how efficiently you've been able to put together this model, uh, where the trajectory points from here, particularly for your vertical, uh, which is a premium one at that. Um, what type of recommendations do you provide founders? What type of uh, insights can you provide uh, marketers or just anyone working in the entrepreneurial space in terms of what they could test out, whether it's for their own uh, you know, business model, for the marketing perhaps, what type of uh, you know, words of wisdom do you like to share? I mean, I don't know if I have words of wisdom. I have words. <laughs> <laughs> I have words. I quotes around the words of wisdom. <laughs> you know, like I put words together, they can find their own wisdom in it. Uh, I mean, like, there's a couple of things that I'd like to say, right? Like the first and foremost is everybody is obsessed with this idea of like, you know, lean startups and lean launches. I think, you know, it, it works in large part, but the reality is that startup has to be able to create value for the consumer, Right. So launch, any product that you're trying to launch, a launch a product that creates value. If it's a big build, be the, do the big build. If it's a small build, do the small build. But don't be obsessed with the small build. Be obsessed with value creation, right? Um, and secondly is, you know, nobody knows your business better than you, right? And I see this a lot with like first time or second time founders, less so with second time, but a lot of the first time founders is that they're trying to get the, the other guy to fix their problem, right? They're like, hire that consultant, or hire this guy, or bring him in. Like, you, you know, this guy will solve my problems. But the reality is, nobody knows your business better than you, man. Like, you know, understand what you're doing. You know what you're doing. Just have no fear and just execute it. And if it messes up, it messes up. It's part of the process, right? But to expect other people to fix your business, it just doesn't work. So understand the value that you're creating. Understand that you know what you're creating far better than anybody else. And just be fearless in, in that execution. I love it. Couldn't agree more. Even as a service provider and a group that is brought in to support, um, I could tell you how much more successful it is when a founder follows those three recommendations in terms of knowing the value creation, really understanding it, and from the shoes of the other side of the table. You know, what does their experience look like? What does the value feel like over there? Uh, you know, understanding that you know the business better than anyone else. Sure, you could bring in consultants, you could bring in agencies, you could bring in employees, but don't expect them to solve your problem as much as work on your behalf in yeah. a direction, yes, they could provide, you know, industry expertise and different types of knowledge, uh, but it's still off your overall path that you're carving out for them to operate within uh, and being fearless about that. You know, I've heard a lot of say, uh, sayings, you know, fail fast, don't be afraid to fail, whatever it may be. For us, you know, it's all these series of tests. It's okay if a test fails. In right. fact, the findings could be more valuable than if it were successful. You can have something uh, stronger that is developed as a result. So I uh, can't echo those three points enough. Right. And, you know, the thing is, like, you know, when you bring an outside agency, they're amplifiers. They can't amplify you unless you're clear about where you're going. Right? Like, nobody's going to come tell you what your problems are. You know those problems better than anybody. Solve them. Then bring in the amplifier, either it be through employees, consultants, whoever, and they'll help you amplify. But, you know, but, they, but they're just that, amplifiers. Exactly. That's a word that we use regularly here. I can't, uh, not enough to uh, support that point. Uh, it's how I look at digital marketing 
uh, as a whole. And I throw the word digital in there. It's true for marketing, uh, but ju just digital alone allows for scale. It allows to do things at a much more amplified level. You know, I right. can reach out to, let's say, one doctor at a time, you know, maybe send 50 calls, 100 emails a day. Yeah, I'm sure there's some sales guys thinking right. those numbers are weak and it could be more aggressive, but there's still limitations in comparison to how many emails, LinkedIn messages um, can be sent in the same day, how many people can be reached with an advertisement uh, that are very targeted in that same window of time. So uh, that that's what digital allows for in my eyes is, is amplification. Oh, 100%. And like, you know, and there's some entrepreneurs out there where, where they don't want like to, uh, too much of an application of their business because they don't want that, right? Sure. Uh, and, and, and there's some businesses that, you know, that you start because, you know, you just don't want to answer to anybody. And I have friends like that where you're like, hey, man, you, you made a, you know, I mean, like, you know, like in the grand scheme of things, you know, you didn't make a lot of money, but to the, but you could really scale this up. And I'm like, yeah, you can really scale this up, man. Like, you know, look, come on, do it, do it. They're like, no, I'm cool. <laughs> you know, no. I'm chill. <laughs> like, you know, amplification is not for everybody because, like, as you scale, you know, you'll find you have more problems, right? Like different types of problems, uh, you know, with that scale and, you know, and, and, and with that growth, either in terms of hiring processes or customer service processes, that, that may just not be for you, right? You just sure. may be just a simple, uh, small problem solver. I just want to live my life. Me, on the other hand, I'm not like that. Like, I want to have more problems. I'm happier with more problems. <laughs> but you know, but other people may not be like that, right? Sure. Find what fits you best. And exactly. what about in terms of optimization? You know, and given the theme of the show, but not everything works right out of the gate. I would say most right. things do not. Right. Uh, even if they are working, there's always a way to refine and focus on what's really driving. How does one go about optimizing in your eyes? I mean, so, you know, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta have a process, right? Like, and the process for anything is really important. So you gotta understand, okay, if I'm optimizing Y, what's my final output, right? What's my, what's my X? If I optimize Y, if if I'm gonna spend 50 hours optimizing Y, and I'm not, I'm only gonna get like one hour worth of value at the end. Don't do that, right? Um, so really figure out, you know, uh, for I mean, for example, for us, right? Like when we started building this out. Um, you know, we had a lot of things that we have to like hit hit on in terms of like you know small minor functionality points, you know, and like that are that are given to us by you know by you know by government agencies and members of the organizations. But we were like, okay, how do we how do we optimize this? So like you know that was core. I you know I started looking at them. Okay, this we can't. If I don't work on this, this is not going to get you know. If, if somebody messes it up, it's gonna it's gonna be a big problem, right? So I just sat down. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna spend my time and you know build out a workflow and optimize for this because this is very core to what we do, right? Because all the small functionalities on the doctor side of the MR have have a role to play, but but on the flip side, there's other things like how do I send messages to doctors on LinkedIn? I'm not really too concerned about, right? So first, figure out what is core and what is not core, and what the output of that optimization looks like. Once you have that in place, then you can start making decisions on, okay, you know, then put and implement the process. Like, again, you know, for us it was, I will just sit down and, you know, write down these requirements because I understand the product, I understand the vision, and we'll just mingle those two. So that was our solution to optimizing, you know, how we built the product, product requirements, um, you know, for Dr. EMR your problem might be different but first identify what it if the product is the problem is crucial or not mm -hmm. identify it be able to really uh validate if it's crucial or not then figure out the best viable solutions from there exactly exactly okay. i feel like i talked like around circles in that but like but there's but i really do believe that first figure out like what are you trying to optimize for don't optimize for the sake of optimizing i think that's not the right way to do it Yes. First, figure out the problem. Like, in, you know, as a startup, you're solving problems, right? You're solving problems all day long. So even within your startup, things that you're optimizing, first figure out if they're actually a problem or not. And having that whole, uh, you know, growth map, you know, I get asked about growth hacks all the time. What's a growth hack? And I start by asking, what's the growth model? Like, what are yeah. you trying to accomplish? What are the numbers? And then from there, uh, 
you know, being able to look at those measurements, the numbers, the only way to really calculate it, in my opinion, and uh, look at tactics from there that can ramp things up quicker, or if they're not happening at all, to, to be able to generate that initial traction. Uh, but like you said, it's it's a key part of the equation. I know from the marketing side, uh, I, I really look at marketing talent and try to, 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 to gauge their problem solving abilities. Because anyone could, you know, plug in a campaign or, uh, you know, work with uh, a team that gets marketing working right out of the gate and look good. It's yeah. more along the lines of when performance drops. Uh, when the initiatives are not being uh, reached effectively, that the real creativity comes out. And that's why I ask about optimizations. And I don't limit it to marketing, of course. Uh, for me, it uh, applies to entrepreneurship. It applies to, you know, biz dev and a chief revenue officer or even, you know, looking at expenses from a CFO's perspective. But being able to, to really optimize is where I think see, see things, uh, you know, sink or swim in many uh, scenarios. Right, and I mean, like, you know, the thing from a marketing standpoint, I mean, at some point, your growth is going to flatline, right? Mm -hmm. um, that be, that means you're a mature company. So, you know, and again, like, you know, back to my original problem, if, if you're flatline, either, like, you're not doing things right, or, you know, you're a mature company. So first figure out what that is before you start throwing money at it, right? And I feel like a lot of, like, as you get, as your organization becomes larger and as you become more complex, sometimes you lose touch with like, you know, is this actually a problem or not? You just try to find solutions for everything that you think is a problem. So it's just, just take a step back, see if this is actually a problem first. Sure. And what about scale? You know, once you actually have those problems worked out, yeah. you have a model that is continuing to deliver on a consistent basis. Have you been a project, uh, have you been part of any projects that have scaled rapidly? Uh, are there any examples or anything that you've seen that you look to point towards? Or just um, overall uh, interpretations of, you know, how you guys will scale? So, I mean, like, look, so for us, uh, you know, everything I've built I've sold before we had the opportunity to scale uh, for a variety of different reasons, right? That said, with Pocket MD, like, you know, we're having some of the scaling issues because we need to build a solid team to be able to build out the product, right? So we need to have a solid enough, you know, skill set to be able to do what we want to do. You know, so hiring is going to be a biggest problem with, with, you know, with scaling because you need those proper human resources to come in and help you scale. And I, I cannot stress this enough to anybody that's a founder. Put a process to find talent as early as possible. That will help you out tremendous because the talent will be able to replicate what you've done, they'll be able to grow what you, you know, what you want to grow, um, and you won't, you, know, you won't have to be a micromanager. Micromanagers don't work anyway. So build a process to get talent. Once you, if you can get talent, the rest is easy. I uh, am experiencing that uh, with my team. And, uh, you know, talent acquisition as a whole, it uh, <laughs> should not be taken lightly. It's a massive undertaking. Uh, you could meet some of the right candidates early on, uh, but we have to put together the right numbers of, uh, you know, outreach that we're doing, uh, whether it's to partners or on different posting sites uh, to produce enough candidates to then, you know, have a, a funnel all the way down and sync that up with timing. Because if we're not ready to bring somebody on, particularly if they're high level, at that point, <coughs> we may be gone by the time, you know, we are ready to pull the trigger. So uh, I'm glad that you mentioned operational scaling uh, when yeah. talking about growth. I mean, nothing else matters, right? Nothing else matters because you don't have the talent to grow. doesn't matter how good your business is. You ain't going to grow. Sure. So that's the only thing that matters. The talent to grow. And uh, Jeevan, as we begin to wrap up here, uh, any, any closing thoughts, anything that uh, you'd like to leave the listeners with? I mean, you know, like, uh, I, you know, I, I would tell everybody, like, you know, to, to, well, first of all, thank you for listening. I really appreciate that. <laughs> um, and if I wasted your time, really sorry. <laughs> it's no, Jason's no. fault. <laughs> words of wisdom, as I said, words of wisdom. Yeah, I mean, that said, I mean, I, I think that, you know, I think we all have, uh, in ourselves the ability to solve any problem that we tackle. Just have a bold vision and be fearless about what you're trying to solve. Everything else will fall in place. 
but just go out there, put yourself out there. Worst case, if, if even if you mess up, you learn, you grow as a person. And there's nothing, you know, there's no failure is a much better teacher than success. Mm-hmm. So get it done. Yep, we've learned a lot more from uh, failures in marketing and how we've optimized from there than the, the successes. Uh, and I, I thank you for coming on today and being an open book for us here, uh, humbly at that, and being able to share everything that uh, has worked, hasn't worked for Pocket MD, the overall direction uh, which you're going. Uh, the team and I will personally be rooting you on. And um, if somebody wants to get in touch with you, you know, be yeah. able to connect, uh, maybe continue this discussion, but for their own business, or maybe they see a, you know, opportunity uh, available. What is your preferred method of communication? You can email me at jeevan, J-E-E-V-A-N, at pocketmd.ca. Um, so send me an email. I'll answer to all my emails. Um, and hopefully I can, you know, provide some value in return. Putting your email address out there. Love it. Nice guy. Yeah. Uh, to welcome that and uh, you know want want to thank you again want to thank everyone for uh, joining in today and taking part uh, in this uh, authentic discussion and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next time absolutely so look forward to be back here all right take care everyone thank you everyone have a good day